All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. So last time uh, we covered feed forward neural networks. Um, and I think I promised that today we would take a look at uh, an actual example um, of gradient descent and how you can apply it to, uh, for example, like a, a linear regression. So we'll start off today with that. Um, so gradient descent algorithm. So the general equation will typically look something like this, which I know, uh, or I believe we looked at last time. So xj, xj minus one minus alpha, Okay, um, so let's break this down. So the x is uh, the value uh, to be updated. Uh, and, and again, just as a refresher, this whole procedure um, is uh, a numeric way of solving certain types of uh, optimizations. And our application of this is to use this algorithm to solve for beta instead of using the closed form anal analytical solution, which we're used to. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, why we do that um, a little bit later. Uh, but so in, in this context, then uh, we'll usually be um, updating the betas. Uh, so this is previous iteration value. Uh, here we have a learning rate. And so this is specified. Um, this is specified externally by the user. Uh, and once we do the actual application, um, I think it'll be more clear to, to kind of show um, what's going on uh, with, with the learning rate and, and sort of the significance of, of the learning rate uh, as it applies to solving specific types of problems. So we'll talk about that. So f of x is the cost function. Uh, and this is um, the gradient, right? Okay, so you're taking the gradient of the cost function. Uh, so that is essentially looking at all of the partial de derivatives um, for all of the um, parameters contained within, within the cost function. Okay, so let's now think about uh, this as applied to a linear regression. So if we have something like yi, might be something like this, xi1 plus beta2 xi2 and so on. Um, And just to be sort of extra clear here, um, the I index refers to every sort of individual observation. And so you can think of uh, the I's representing each of the rows in uh, your particular data set. And so a generalized form of this, I might say something like this.
Okay, and so this will simply be uh, summing up all of the beta times x's. So for something like a, a linear regression, um, we can let the cost function. Um, well, okay, I mean we can we can think about a, a couple of different cost functions. Um, but this is generally kind of the the loss, the how you could calculate the loss score um, that we covered last time. And in this particular case, we'll just be using um, a slightly modified uh, mean squared error. So. It'll look something like this. So this is my uh, loss function for my beta or cost function. So let the cost function equal the MSE. Okay, and so that's just gonna be uh, one over M where I sum up all of my eyes. So suppose you have M, M rows inside of your data set uh, and that will just be something like this. And this really is just your Y, y I hat, right? And I'm going to do a small modification here because it's just a constant. Uh, I'm just going to add a two over here so that when I do the derivative, uh, it'll just cancel out and make it kind of a little bit more neat. Okay, so I won't get into all of the derivation behind this, but if you solve for this, um, your equation will look something like this. And we're actually going to go ahead and um, I'm going to transform this into a uh, matrix form. And this is going to help with the implementation for showing how to do an actual example, as well as in, um, in the code. So in matrix form, it will look like this. So there's a couple like properties about matrices that you may have to refresh your memory on. Um, but it, it'll end up looking like this. Yeah, so the the betas will actually end up moving to the other side because of how you do uh, dot products. Uh, and then if you have um, x squared, it's xtx. So we also move the x uh, uh, in front in order to perform this operation correctly. Um, but generally, this is what it's going to look like. Um, okay, any questions about this so far? Don't want to move too fast here because we are getting a little bit more into the weeds uh, than we usually do. All right, so let's just do um, 
a practical example of this uh, kind of by hand and then also in the code so that we can see what's happening. Again, we're trying to solve for our betas. Um, and let's say we're going to just, let's say you have a data set that looks something like this. X1, X2. Uh, let's say we're starting with one and two, three, eight, four, seven. And I want to figure out, right, what beta one, X1, beta two, X2. Um, we want to solve for our betas using this gradient descent. And the first thing that you're going to need to do um, and in this case is we're going to reformulate everything into matrices, and we're also going to pick an initial beta. So it's actually pretty straightforward. It's going to look something like this. So um, when you do matrix operations for your um, for your data or when you arrange it into a matrices, your columns will typically uh, will typically will be um, representing uh, each of your variables, and then your rows uh, are indicating each of your um, data points corresponding to uh, those variables. And then we're going to have a beta, which I'll call initial. So this is just going to be our first guess of what beta is going to be. And I'm just going to use 0, 0 for now for the first one. Um, actually, why don't we call this beta 0 up here in the superscript, not the subscript. So we're not confusing anything about um, the parameter assignment to the variable. OK, so then uh, we will have our gradient descent algorithm, which is going to be beta 1 is equal to beta 0 minus alpha times our gradient of the loss function. So this will be 0, 0. And then uh, I'm going to, again, I, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, um, but I'm just going to set my learning rate to be 0.01 for now. 0.01, uh, let's do um, one half. Uh, so this is. Let me jump back for a moment. So we're now essentially plugging this part in. Uh, and the first one is that you have um, this 1 over m. We have two rows, right? two data points. And so uh, it's going to be 1 over 2. And then you've got this xt times x beta minus, or yeah, x beta minus y. So hop on back over here. So we'll now have our inverted matrix, or not inverted, sorry, transpose matrix, so 3, 8, 4, 7, T times 3, 4, 8, 7 um, times 0, 0, minus 1, 2. Um, Alan, could you please explain again what M is? I My internet got a bit disturbed. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, let me jump back here. Uh, so your mean squared error is the average of all of your eyes, right? Uh, of the difference between the prediction. Um, so this is um, sum of i, and say you have m data points, then it would be divided by m, right? So you're looking at the error, the squared error of uh, of each data point, 
and then you divide it by the total number of data points. That's where your M is coming from. Um, so in this particular case, we'll have uh, I equals one and I equals two, you'll have two predicted Y's. So you'll have Y hat for I equals one, Y hat for I equals two, which means you have two error values and then you just take the average of it. So you're dividing by two. Um, okay, so this whole quantity ends up being, if you run this through your local calculator, you'll get 0 0.095 and 0 0.09. So that is our step one. And then we repeat, except now we will have um, beta two is equal to beta one minus here. So now, our equation will look something like this. And everything else will be almost the same, except for our updated beta. We'll have 0 0.095, 0 0.09 minus Okay, um, so you'll notice that the main difference is that you've now updated your betas in your next step. Uh, and this ends up, if you plug this in, you'll end up getting something like this. And the whole idea is that you will continue to iterate until you've reached uh, a final solution. Okay, and then how do you know that you've reached a final solution? Generally, what you're gonna do is you're gonna check some kind of um, epsilon cutoff so that if your betas are changing by under a certain threshold, you will then choose to stop your algorithm uh, and then take those kind of final points. So on the next update, uh, let's say I want to, let's say I'm going to continue to run this until the difference between my, you know, beta one and beta two is no more than like 0 0.0001 or something. And so the algorithm is just going to continue iterating each of these steps uh, until it reaches that threshold uh, and then it will stop and then you sort of take those as your betas. Okay. Questions? If not, let's jump on over to R. And I'm just going to go ahead and um, quickly implement exactly what we just did. Um, so we're going to have a data table. Our x1 was 3 and 8, and our x2 was four and seven, and then we have y equals one and two. And I'm actually gonna run a regression using the normal method really quick, just so we can verify uh, whether or not our algorithm works. And in, in, in the example that I gave, I didn't have an intercept, so I just put zero for that. Um, and so let's just quickly take a look. Your screen is frozen. Oh, uh, okay. Um, 
That's fine. I don't know why this always happens, but I guess we're going to deal with it as always. Okay. Um, in the meantime, I will copy and paste some of this into the chat. Okay. Um, so I've copied and pasted some of it into the chat and We'll kind of just walk through this. So the first thing I did was I set up a data table um, that contained all of the like the exact same um, example points that I was giving in the handwritten notes. Uh, and then I set up a model, a linear model where I can just run it. And if you look at the summary of that model, um, which you'll be able to see once the, the screen comes back up, but you can run it on your own as well. Uh, you get an estimate for beta one is, I'll just type it in, it's about 0 0.09. And then beta two is 0.1818, repeating. Okay, and so these are going to be the values that we're going to try and aim for uh, as we run the gradient descent. Uh, I've written a function um, that takes in an alpha, an x, a y, and a beta, and then it does the update. So this is this function that I wrote called update.beta is essentially one step, uh, and it's the same step that I gave in the uh, example notes. So you can see it first calculates your M based off of the, the number of rows. In this case, it'll just be two, but it's uh, generalized in the function. And then you have your output, which is just that um, update function where you have the um, beta or more generically, whatever thing that you're updating. Uh, so minus alpha, your learning rate, divided by m times that gradient. Um, OK, cool. We're, we're in business, hopefully. Folks can see this. And then I've set up my x, y, and beta in uh, matrices. So if I do new beta, Um, I'm going to use the update function and we can see what happens in a single step. And if I run this, oh, I haven't executed this yet. Okay, so if I run all of this, I can look at my new beta and it, it will be 0.095 and 0.9, which are the values that we solve for manually by hand. Um, okay, and so we, we know this is working, and now let's do an iteration. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'll just, for i in 1, 2, and I'm going to leave this blank for now. Uh, we'll have a new beta. So this, this for loop is going to update the new beta. And in the next iteration, it's just going to put that new beta directly into here. So let's just do a small number for now. Let's just say 1 to 10. Um, and let's run this. And actually, I can print out what's happening to the betas as it runs through the for loop. And what you can see 
is that it's printing out these values uh, and every step that we take our, our estimate of the beta um, is moving in a certain direction uh, and, and it's updating with this new value. Um, we do note that the betas are not matching with uh, the ones coming from the linear regressions yet, but we've only done some like 10 iterations or so. I'm gonna get rid of the print and let's just see what happens if I say a thousand. So I'll run this and I'm gonna look at my new beta. Uh, and now you can see that it's getting really close to the values um, in the regression. Uh, let's see if I do like 2000, if it gets closer. Not, not actually sure if it will, but okay, yeah. So, so now it's, it's basically sort of right on. And usually this would happen in some kind of uh, less manual fashion so that you could uh, end the algorithm once you reach your um, desired cutoff. Um, okay, so now let me talk. Um, well, okay, so so you could see, uh, so, so you could see that the the algorithm is, is working, and this this is like a, a sort of nice viable alternative to doing the closed form solution, um, particularly for uh, really large data sets. And let me let me revisit that in, in just a moment. But let's first talk about the, the learning rate. Uh, let's actually go back to, let's say, 1 through 20. And I'm going to change the learning rate this time. Let's change it to 0.1 instead of 0.01. And let me look at what happens here. Oh, I want to print it this time so we can see what's happening to the betas as they update. Um, OK, something interesting is happening here. Uh, so in the first iteration, it jumped. This is actually the second one because I didn't print out. Let's let's do this. Okay. So you can see the values are really quite different. Um, wait a minute. Did it not? Oh, here we go. So in our first update, it's 0.95 instead of 0.9, and then successively. Uh, you can see that the betas that are getting updated look really different from the ones before. Um, so these are the ones before. You can see that these are actually kind of, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say converging, but they're all sort of near a certain value, right? It's all about 0 0.12, 0 0.13. And eventually, after many iterations, it gets to close to um, the betas that we see in the linear regression um, from the closed form solution. But here we see something really different happening. So it starts at 0.95 and 0.9, and then it goes up to negative four. And every time you actually see the betas are growing. Um, okay, and so this is definitely not the right answer. This is like, uh, you know, some quadrillion uh, beta. Um, so what the heck is going on here? So let's let's talk um, a little bit more about uh, qualitatively about what gradient descent is is doing. So last time I gave this this kind of example um, where you have x one x two. And then you had kind of like a, a topology type of thing, right? Like this, and then you're moving in the direction uh, down towards um, the, the pit. And so another 
and maybe an easier way to look at this um, if we're talking about this in less dimensions is let's have a, a y and x um, So in a gradient descent, uh, you start at some point uh, and then you essentially walk down, uh, you take a step down the path uh, and then that's your next value. And then you take another step and another step and, and so on. Um, and you may even, uh, you might even do something like this. Um, hang on. You could go something like this, and you would take a step in this direction all the way over here. And then you could take a step in this direction till you get to here, and so on and so forth. So the gradient is the thing that's helping you go in the right direction. And the alpha is telling you how big of a step to take. If your steps are too large, you might imagine something happening like this. Uh, so you say, uh, I start here and uh, I wanna take a big step this way. And I jump over here and it says, oh, whoa, I'm like, I'm way off now, right? So I've stepped in that direction because that's where the gradient told me to go, but I've stepped too far. And so now it's, it's essentially going to say, well, take an even bigger step the other direction because we want to get back on, on that side because your the gradient is now steeper, right? Uh, so now I might go all the way out here. Um, and then this is going to jump all the way out here and so on. And then you get this kind of uh, ping pong effect where you're getting bigger and bigger. And so that's what's happening in, in this case. Um, your step size is too big. So as you look at your gradient and decide to take a really big step based off of your, your alpha, you're going too far to the other side, essentially. And then uh, you're going to blow up in, in, in value. And so, um, OK, uh, I see uh, a question. Did you want to type it or, or chat it? Either way is fine. Actually, I have to. Uh, oh, yes. OK, I see. Um, so there's a question. So what happens if the curve is not convex? Yeah, OK, so let's let's talk about. Um, let's let's talk about uh, a couple sort of. Um, things about application. Yeah, so what happens if the curve is not convex? So the example that I just gave, you have something like x and a y. So in, in, in reality, right, this, this is going to be like your beta, and this might be like your loss uh, or your, um, your oops. This might be your cost function or, or just your cost. And then the actual line is the, is the function. So, so ours is pretty simple because in this one, you always go down to the pit, uh, uh, the smallest um, point on, on the cost curve. But uh, let's suppose you have, um, let's suppose you have something like this. Um, so if I start here and I go down this way, 
I may converge to a step here, even though um, you you really want your um, you really want the smallest cost um, across the full sort of uh, cost function. So this is definitely possible, um, and this happens when your uh, cost functions are are non-convex. Um, and so depending on your starting point, you could get in the right place. Um, but if you are starting, say, to the right of this place, you're going to get stuck at, uh, at this location. So the first thing I'll say about this is that um, you generally, uh, so, so in a non-convex um, cost function, so this generally applies more, uh, to, to any sort of uh, optimization, a non-convex optimization that looks at the, like this, there is, there is literally never a guarantee that you can get what's known as a global minimum, right? So this is our global minimum. And this is our local minimum. Uh, but there are a couple ways uh, and, and techniques that people use to um, try and uh, try and ensure that it's it's as likely as possible that you're getting the global global minimum. Uh, so one common technique is called a multi-start. Um, and what that means is that I, I will run my algorithm at multiple places, at multiple locations across the range of, of the search space um, of the X that I have. Uh, and by doing that, you are so, um, you are essentially attempting to um, you're attempting to to run the algorithm many times across a search space that that can look at multiple sort of these pits and and being able to to find the, the smallest one. Um, th the reason why that's never like quite a guarantee is like your curve could even look something like this, where you come up and then you have something like this, like you could really easily miss something like that, but, but it's a little more unusual for something like that to happen. So, so that I, I would say is one of the more common, common strategies to, to do this. Um, so fortunately, in the context of linear regressions where your parameters are linearized, uh, Yeah, I don't believe you'll run into this type of problem that often. Um, yeah, I'll 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 kind of I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that. I I, I think that um, in the cases where you do run into problems like these, doing multi starts uh, and checking against like uh, a couple initial betas, right? Instead of just zero zero, you could try. You know other combinations uh, across the uh, across the search space um, of of initial betas. I think that that should usually take care of it. Okay. Um, So I mentioned before, so in our closed form analytical solution, um, we prefer gradient descent because you don't have to deal with holding uh, or, 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 or with, with, with doing a matrix inversion on a really, really big matrix, um, which is extremely memory intensive. And 
you might be looking at, at our equation for the gradient descent. Um, and you might think that, OK, if I, if I look at my um, gradient, I actually have something similar. It's, so this is not doing a matrix inversion, so it's not going to be quite as crazy, but you still are looking at your entire sort of x, right? And so that in itself can still be memory intensive. So what benefit is, is there to doing this? Uh, and so what I showed in this example is actually, and, and this was mentioned in, in the last lecture, this is actually a specific form of gradient descent known as uh, batch gradient descent. And that is where we take all of the data and update all of our parameters at the same time. Um, and so this uses the MSE as the cost function. So your F of beta is equal to one over two M sum I uh, of F beta X I minus Y I squared. So you can also not do this all at once. And you could do something called stochastic gradient descent, which is a slight modification of this. Um, and it's just something like this. So in this case, you are updating your beta against a single row of data. Uh, and this lets you iterate really quickly through all of your uh, all of your rows. Uh, and, and in fact, the way that it's actually done, you know, if you run like a uh, like a neural network um, function or some other function that does gradient descent, um, it does what's known as a mini batch gradient descent. And that is a hybrid between your batch and stochastic. So it's a stochastic, you're looking at one row at a time to update your betas. In a mini, in a batch, you're looking at everything. In a mini batch, you randomly select uh, a certain number of rows from your full data set, and then you run that. And then you iterate through your steps, looking at uh, different rows. Um, and the sort of general guiding principle for why this works is because as you feed in data, you're still like walking in the correct direction based on the gradients. You're, um, you know, it, it depends on the, the data points that you plug in, but generally you're gonna be going in the right direction. And so the model saying, well, I don't need to look at all of the data to, to get the exact right direction. I just need to be going generally in the right um, path. And then I can like iterate through different portions of my data to make sure that I'm not like losing any of my fidelity. And, and this will really, uh, th this, is, this is actually a really efficient way of, um, of converging to the right solution without being um, you know, one at a time, as you would with the stochastic, or um, or you know, being very memory intensive, as you would with the batch gradient descent. So this this comes down to some of the like practical implementation and application of gradient descent algorithms, and 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 the mini batches is, is really the one that has allowed um, for a, the sort of larger machine learning data sets to. Um, to be able to be computed uh, fairly easily compared to just doing a traditional like linear regression. And the other thing is, is that again, this the, the closed form solution, the XT X inverse times XTY 
to solve for betas. That's only for a linear regression. You can you can apply this gradient descent to uh, uh, basically any regression model. So because it's generalized, um, it's a nice way of, of being able to have like one size fits all estimator for your um, for your betas. Okay, uh, let's take a quick break um, for now, and uh, I will be happy to take any questions in the meantime.
Okay, let's continue onwards. Um, so someone wanted to know uh, about GLMMs uh, yesterday. So this is actually a, a good kind of topic to get into, um, I think. It's not something that um, was on the syllabus. But still useful. So this is generalized linear mixed models. Uh, however, to talk about this, we're going to first learn about GLMs. So this is a generalized linear models. And then we're going to have to talk about L LMMs. This is a linear mixed models. And then we can talk about GLMMs. All right. So um, GLM, this is a class of models that can be generalized across a set of specific characteristics. Um, yeah, this is, and, and so G, GLMs are uh, a nice kind of framework for discussing and, and maybe kind of cohesively bringing back together a lot of the um, models that, that we've discussed and, and how they're related. Um, the, the three sets of characteristics that we talk about with GLMs, um, and uh, if, you look, if you look at different resources, you'll find that uh, like people use different names and nomenclature for them, but, but generally they're, they're they're all going to be the same thing, um, or, or they, they, they will kind of mean um, the same thing. So you have a random component, you have a systematic component, and again, people call these different things, but we'll describe what they are in a moment, uh, and then a link function, and that one's pretty consistent, everyone calls it a link function. Um, and so this is this this one describes how the random and systematic components relate. Um, the random component is kind of like the distribution of your y um, slash error term, right? Because uh, like, for example, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, in just a second, but like in a linear regression, your y's and the errors associated with the y's are going to be normally distributed, right? Uh, if, if the errors aren't uh, normally distributed, then you probably have some bias in the model uh, for uh, in, in a linear regression. The systematic components is um, uh, the structure, it's kind of the, the structure of your X's. Um, and for GLMs, it's generally going to be, it, it's, it's almost always going to be linear in parameters, right? So your betas and your X's will be, um, will be linear. Okay, and, and so again, the GLM isn't like this specific formula or model that we'll be talking about. It is kind of a framework to describe the whole set of models that, that we've already covered and, and a set of, of other models that, that we won't even sort of really talk about in, in this class. So let's 
think about a, the application of this GLM framework to some of the models that we have talked about. So in a linear regression, you got yi equals beta zero plus beta one xi plus epsilon i. So the first thing is we have our error term. So this is our random components. Um, we assume in a linear regression that the errors are normally distributed. So this would be something like n0, signal like that. Uh, we've got our systematic components. Uh, linear in parameters. The way they usually write this looks something like this. And then lastly, we have, oh, hang on, this is two. And lastly, we have our link function. Uh, and so this is an identity. It's called the link identity. And this just means our x beta is equal to mu. And so we can we can make a table. I'll, I'll do that in a moment, and sort of characterize a linear regression as uh, you know having be as being defined as as uh, having these three uh, pieces where the random component is normally distributed, the systematic component is linear in parameters, and the link function is the identity. We can look at something like a logistic regression. And you'll have like a logit pi where pi is the probability of success, right? Associated with like a one and zero in your Y. Uh, so you'll have log pi over one minus pi is equal to beta zero plus beta xi. Okay, and so, um, yeah, check the notes if this isn't uh, immediately clear what's going on here. Um, but let's talk about the components again. So our random components. So the distribution of Y is binomial and Pi as opposed to um, normally distributed, as you see in the linear regression. Um, systematic components is linear in parameters. And then our link function is logit link, which is um, x beta equals ln mu over 1 minus mu. OK, and so uh, again, the, the GLM is now allowing us to kind of describe these different regressions in this framework. And what we can do 
is generalize this across a whole set of different types of regression models. Um, and I don't even know the name for, for some of these, but we'll, we'll kind of write these in. And I'll actually just do so random components, um, systematic components. link function. OK, so we had our linear random components, so normal. Um, and so this is going to be linear in parameters. And I'm just going to draw an arrow here because most of these examples are going to be like that. Link function is identity. And then we had logistic. So this would be um, what I just say, um, binomial uh, link function is logit link. Uh, you can have something like a uh, log linear um, and actually it'll also be the same for a Poisson regression. Uh, your random component would be a Poisson distribution and then your link function would be a log link uh, and this would be this is x beta equals ln of mu. Um, other ones you could have, you could have an exponential here. Uh, and generally, you'd have like a negative inverse. And this is something like x beta equals negative mu to the negative 1. There's like an inverse Gaussian. This is an inverse squared. So that's x beta equals negative. Oh, uh, not negative. It's just mu negative 2. Um, yeah, OK. So. Again, this is our way of being able to generalize a whole bunch of models um, that use, you know, different random components and link functions uh, into some kind of generalized form. Um, and be because of the inherent um, flexibility and, and, and framework of this, you are able to then apply uh, some kind of generalized um, like function to be able to do a lot of these these uh, uh, or, or be able to run models with a uh, with a lot of different uh, characteristics, um, whether it's in your random component, your systematic component, or your, or your link function. Um, and so there, there's a there's a function in in R called GLM, which we've looked at, and we've looked at specific application of GLM to run something like a logistic model. Uh, but in reality, you're able to run a whole bunch of different types of of, of things, um, or different types of models depending on how you want to you know, characterize um, its its parameters within the the GLM framework. All right, any questions about GLM? OK. So we'll move on to our next uh, topic, which is linear mixed models. 
I mean, all of this, right, is kind of building up to getting to the GL MMs that um, someone was interested in. So this is uh, not related really to GLMs that we were just talking about. We'll, we'll see how the, it, it plays in, um, in in a little bit, but uh, mixed models, linear mixed models are actually a pretty handy tool um, to, to get at certain types of inference. And, and actually that's one of the reasons why it's it's not on, on the syllabus. I, I had mentioned before that like a lot of the material in the in the course is more focused on predictive models than inferential models. Um, but we're we're kind of doing a one doing a bit of a 180 here. Um, and this is gonna like put us solidly in, in the camp where, where we're really uh, concerned with understanding the effect of like particular variables, uh, right, which is which is inference as opposed to just trying to get the best like predictive uh, Y out of the model as, as possible. Um, so this is an extension, extension of linear models that allow both fixed and random effects. So these types of models are particularly useful for uh, hierarchical data. For data in a hierarchical structure. Okay. So what does that mean? Let's take a example here. So consider something like we have x1 and y. Okay, I'm gonna draw these points carefully here. So I'll have something like this, and we'll have something like this. And then we'll have something like this. All right. So if I were to draw, uh, or if I were to fit this to a linear regression, I might get something, a, a line that, that might look like something like this. Okay, and so we would describe this effect of, of x1 through um, uh, as it relates to y with this red line. However, let's consider that we actually have another variable called x2. And what I'll do is redraw the data. I'm going to try and put these points in the same place. Okay, so now you've got some like groupings of points. So, so our X2 is um, your different colors. Okay, it, it might be like a categorical variable. Um, it's, it's, uh, it might be something like, um, uh, what's the classical example that they use for like, uh, patients and doctor visits, and then you may have something specific about the, the doctor. But, but anyways, the, the whole point is you've got some kind of grouping effect going on here. 
Um, and if I were to look individually at those groups and, and I were to like run a regression, um, you know, you might, you might say that the effect would be like really different. And, and in other words, um, a lot of the, a lot of the explanation for your whys is actually due to your X2, um, uh, X2 variable. So then that begs the question, well, can't we just control for X2 and throw that into the model? Um, and, and here's where you get into some of the like uh, caveats and, and sort of um, nuances that you'll get into for, for inference. Um, you know, in a, in a predictive model, yeah, sure, that would work perfectly fine. I just want to control for as many things as possible and, and be able to get my predictions. But in this case, um, okay, so let's say, can't we just control for X2? Um, so in this case, we want, to know the effect of x1 given x2's variation uh, not just the effect of x2. In other words, if you just throw in x2, well, so we we could we could actually look at at this x1 right by carving out the the data and then running the regression just on those, but that's generally bad practice because you end up omitting a lot of data, um, and you might be missing like other underlying effects. So you want to use as much of the data as possible, um, but if I just throw in x2. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, especially if you have correlations between your X1 and X2, you would mainly just being observing the effect of X2 and not really being able to understand what X1 is, what's happening with X1. Uh, and instead, we want to be able to look at that, uh, at the specific effect of X1 given X2's variation. So the way this works is we actually introduce um, a new term here. And so this is our random effects term. So generally, the explanatory variables of interest are going to be your fixed effects in your in your x's. So this is going to be your fixed effects terms. And then the thing that you're trying to control for, the, the variation you're trying to control for, are going to be your random effects term. Uh, if we were to like calibrate the model in, in a certain way, um, you could in theory like estimate your use in a similar way that you would estimate the betas, but actual, but actually what we do is we, we generally, um, okay, so we generally do not estimate you like with beta. Instead, it is assumed that you is normally distributed zero with a standard deviation equal to G, where G 
is the variance covariance matrix. Covariance matrix of the random effects variables. Okay, and so if you look at this equation, uh, what you'll see is that y will now be essentially getting influenced by your um, by the z term random effects uh, and the and it will include all of the sort of variance that you see uh, within um, all the, all the variance that's happening uh, within all of the different groups, right? Um, and then you calibrate the rest of your variables, um, your x and your beta. Uh, you, 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 then you can calibrate what your fixed effects variables of interest that you're um, that that you want to have a beta that takes into account all of the variance from these, these random error terms. All right, any questions about that? Yeah, uh, I was just wondering, so if we have like beta one, X one, um, Mm -hmm. And if we have like an X2 in the random effects term, then the interpretation of beta would be just the effect of X1, you know, without the given X2's variation. Is that how it would be? Uh, so, okay, if we're talking about like this example, so the one on the left is just your typical linear model. And then the one on the right, if you control for the variation or, or the variance uh, that's uh, in in y that's coming essentially from um, from x two or in other words the z uh, your interpretation of like the beta coefficient for x one is it's still the same kind of um, interpretation where it's describing the slope of the effect of, of X1 on Y. It's just that in this case, you've controlled for uh, X2 in, in a different way than you normally would have, essentially. So maybe, okay, let's, let's do the R example and then uh, we'll be able to run uh, an actual model of this and then we'll see if you still have questions about the interpretation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was trying to look up um, some data sets uh, to do this um, example, and I stumbled across this uh linear mixed models tutorial where someone made this artificial data set about dragons so that's what we're going to work with um you've got test scores apparently these dragons are taking tests of some kind uh body length and then a couple other variables, um, mountain range and, and site. Uh, and I think the site describes where the dragons are being sampled and the mountain range is like the origin of the dragons. But okay, we, we don't need to know too much about that. Um, we can look at this distribution, so test scores, um, and I've checked, right? So this is normally distributed, so it's all right. We have body length. Uh, and then the dragons are 
sort of equally sample, I guess, from, from these mountain ranges. Is that part of a library? It's, it's not running on mine. Uh, so, so yeah, you need to get this data, which I put on Canvas. Um, it's under the lecture 16 files, um, or it should be there. Let me double check really quickly. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's a dragons.r data in the canvas files for this lecture. And so you can um, grab that really quick and, and you should be able to load in the data. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new um, a new variable called body length 2. And it's just going to be a scaled version of body length. OK, and what we'll do is we'll look at a simple linear model, of these dragons. And let's look at the results. OK, so very statistically significant. Uh, I guess the longer the dragons are, the smarter they are, or well, I shouldn't say that, the, the higher they score on their tests. Um, okay. So let's take a look at the data and the fits. And I will include a best fit line from the linear regression. Great. OK. So we have this data. Um, and I've run, run this regression. And it looks fairly good, although you have a lot of, it looks like there's a lot of variation in, in, in the data. However, if I were to plot this and separate out, let's say, by the mountain range where the dragons are from, what you'll see, similar to the example from the handwritten notes, Um, a lot of the points are are being grouped in, in certain ways, right? So like, you know, you don't see any blue or green points down here, right? You don't see any purple points or red points over here and, and, and so on. So um, there's definitely some kind of... Uh, correlation um, between the body length and the mountain range, as, as well as some relationship with the test score as well. Um, let's take a look at the data individually for the mountain ranges. So I can do that with this facet wrap. And it'll split out all the data into each of the mountain ranges. So it'll look something like this. Um, yeah, and so in this case, we definitely see some kind of relationship right between the test score, the mountain range, and, and the body, the body length, and, and as well as the sort of body length and, and the, uh, the mountain range. And so if I really wanted to understand something about the test score where I, where I actually control for the variation, um, then we could do something like this. 
and, and again, like you could in theory just run the linear regression against the data contained within each of the mountains. Uh, presumably there's also the whole, uh, you know, for any sort of set of, of categor categorical variables, you, you could do this, but again, you'd be omitting a lot of the data. And, and so being able to get at the actual relationship between the variable of interest, your body length and your test score, it's better to, to have some kind of method of keeping everything in. And so that's what we're doing. Um, that's what we're trying to do here. So I can, as I was mentioning, simply control for the mountain range. Um, and look at these results. Um, and what you would see is that the body length is no longer significant. Um, but this isn't what we want, right? We want to be able to quantify test scores for mountain ranges, or we, we don't want to just quantify what the test scores are based off the mountain range. We want to control for the variation from the mountains and treat those as random factors. So what we'll do, um, so I actually probably don't even have this installed. So I will have to do this as well. So LME4, so that's a uh, linear uh, mixed effects models. So we'll go ahead and install that package really quickly. And then load it. And let's make a uh, linear mixed models. So you'll use the LMER um, function, and then it's written much in the same way as a regular uh, linear regression, except for your mixed, uh, for, sorry, for your random effects, you'll have something like this. Um, so this, I don't know why the syntax is quite like like this, but this is how you in, uh, indicate that a variable is a random effect as opposed to a fixed effects, which is just sort of normally input. Okay. Um, so you'll notice uh, the outputs look quite a bit different. You have two sections, uh, random effects and fixed effects. And the fixed effects are actually going to look kind of similar to what we're used to seeing, right? We have our coefficients, the estimate of the value of the coefficients, as well as um, your standard errors and t values and, and p values. And, and actually, so here we can see that it's still uh, it's it's no longer statistically significant compared to the uh, original one, um, but actually it's still uh, kind of double in value compared to when you just control for the mountain range and the linear regression. Um, and then the random effects are going to tell you how much of the variance in your output in your response variable is due to uh, a particular random effect. Uh, and, and actually, we can observe that uh, a pretty substantial proportion of it is actually coming from the, the mountain range. Um, and so if I were to do, um, you, you can calculate that by, um, you can calculate that by just doing the ratio of the variance compared to the total variance. Oops. It'll be something like 339.7 divided by 339.7 plus 223.8. Um, so that's based on here. Um, 
so the variance in the output that's that's coming from the mountain range is actually a fairly significant chunk of so 60 percent is coming from the, the mountain range uh yeah and so this is um a particularly kind of handy way of being able to take into account variance of the variables uh, effect on your outcome that you are kind of less interested in, in understanding the inference of and then allowing that to still um, be retained as, as controlled within, within the model. Um, yeah, and so the linear mixed model is uh, a nice little tool um, for doing inferential uh, types of analysis and in, in regression. Are there any questions about that? Okay. Um, so that finally brings us to, um, I think it was Daniel's question about GLMMs. So generalized linear mixed models. And, and here I, I, so I don't, I'm not gonna do any sort of examples from this, um, but a GL, uh, a linear model, a simple linear model is to a GLM as a linear mixed model is to a, a generalized um, linear mixed models. In other words, it can take on other uh, forms for the, so if we remember the three components, you have the random components, the systematic components, and then the link function. So a GLM um, uh, is the same thing where you have, let me clear this. Um, so where you have something like a Y equals X beta plus ZU, so error, this will be like this. Um, it's, it's like this, but now uh, you could have different link functions for both your Xs and for your Zs, uh, as well as um, the random components uh, related to, um, to your uh, Ys can be different. And so you could actually have uh, different distributions um, within your within the same model. Uh, the link function doesn't have to be the identity for both of them. You could have one, um, you know, you could have your link identity for your random effects be one uh, one type of link function, and then you could have a different type of link function for for your axes. So that's all all that means for for a GLMM. It's the generalized version of the linear mixed model in the same way that GLM is the generalized version of your, of your linear model. Um, so hopefully that helps with, uh, with that particular question. Um, yeah, and I guess that's actually all I have for today. So we'll end a little bit early, um, unless there's any particular questions, I'll stick around uh, a, a couple minutes for that.